just like to uh, I'd like to crack it down. I'd just like to introduce Anthony now. As I said, I've known him for about 20 years. Um, I was just telling him the other day, when I first came here, I came to the Canberra um, chapter, as they used to call it then, and um, I felt there was, um, for me, there was something lacking. And I asked, what was the other chapter like? And they said, well, Anthony runs that, and he's, He's really into the, um, you know, joyful approach and the, the Pentecostal approach. And I thought, <coughs> that's for me. So I asked to transfer. You had to do that in those days. You did it by permission so everything would be in order. And no one would be insulted or anything like that. And I did it properly and I was grateful, I was, I can say, gratefully accepted. I was welcomed. <laughs> I don't know how grateful it was, but I was working. <laughs> and Anthony's a great encourager. And it's something I've learned to do. And his encouragement actually brought me to the point where I could believe that I was a prophet called by God. Because I'm very careful with that sort of thing. There's too many people walk around now saying, I'm this, I'm that. And it's, it's not true. There's no one to confirm it. But anyway, I want to introduce Anthony. If you come up here, <laughs> if you could all just um, raise your hands, we'll pray for him. Heavenly Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you flood Anthony with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Amen. Give him your words, Lord. Let his mouth speak your words, Lord. And open our hearts to receive them, Lord. Lord, just bless this man, Lord, as he speaks to us and shares with us out of his experience and out of his deep love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I feel so blessed. What the way Frank shared and the way Paul challenged us about the vision. I thought, wow, I want to feel it. Who's next? I thought I'm meant to share something too. So God is so beautiful. Well, it's, uh, I was born again more than 45 years ago now, 16th of June, 1974, which was my nana's birthday. And uh, I wouldn't call myself a seeker. And some people just seek, go through everything, just searching for God. Just briefly, a background, I was I think a gentle boy, but I had this great streak of stubbornness and uh, wasn't given any, I'm still stubborn, but I think the purification has taken place. Head may argue about that, but, but he's certainly putting in a holy determination through that tray. And, uh, but not being held from the age of two, I didn't really get enough, that emotional input that is so healthy, a healthy soul. And uh, my dad was, I think my dad and mum, they, they were hard working and they were good people, moral people. My dad was man, more flamboyant, more, more, had more of an anger issue. And uh, so I just closed my mind off. That was my instinctive defence to protect myself from being hurt. And I, sh I put up this wall, this defence, this concrete shield of stubbornness. So I went through life and I guess I, I wasn't a wild boy because of that, but I had a love for tennis, but I didn't really have any sense of compassion or feeling for young women as I became a teenager. I was fairly devoid of life. I scraped through somehow boarding school with uh, four ordinary level passes, my school certificate. Started working on the farm when I was at 17, just after my 17th birthday. And uh, I remember occasions like, which I, this might go anywhere, but we have, were on a farm, we had a 6,000 acre sheep, wheat, cattle farm at Galaganburn, which is 100 k's north of Dubbo. And um, started working, as I said, when I was 17 for my father. And uh, I never understood his signs from a distance. He'd be waving and shouting and do this, and I'd go in the wrong direction. And my brother understood exactly what he meant, but 
different, he was the same personality as my dad, but I didn't have a clue. And pretty, uh, pretty miserable, but just emptied, I suppose. And uh, remember we had 2,500 wieners, marina wieners one time. And it was my responsibility to go around this 900 acre paddock and, and bring them in. Uh, at this stage they had grass, barley grass seed in their eyes. And so I'd go to the first dam and be three or four swimming around around the surface in the dam. So I'd walk in there, grab them, pull them out, tie their feet, put them on the back of the trailer. So it took about five hours, six hours just to, to muster one paddock. And about half, two thirds of them had grass seed in their eyes. So I put them in the sheep yards, take them through to the smaller pens and open up their eyes and get the barley grass out. And some of them had pink eyes, so you could spray them with pink eye spray. And that was just a memory I had of it. And I remember one time, hang on a second. We had some 200 pigs too, which was a bit of a side uh, thing that, that, that said you can look after that, the pigs in your spare time. So it might be at 8 o'clock at night, I've got this uh, silo, this shed which I had opened, shoveling uh, wheat out, filling up the bags, and, and my dad tore down and said, Where you been? Mother's worried about you. And uh, hurry up, get back as soon as possible, and we've had our dinner. And I go across to the pig styes and fill up the self feeders and get home. So I just, images like that come to me. So, um, wasn't real happy at all. And uh, anyway, my, my elder sister had been in Chilwaroo and she'd left, my brother had left after 12 months on the farm and my elder sister and brother came back and brother came back for Christmas, um, which was 1960, I worked 67, 68, so, and Christmas 68, they said, why don't you come down and live with us in, in Sydney? So I said, yes, and then my sister got a whacking around the legs for talking me into leaving. Mm -hmm. So I went to Sydney for a couple of years and that was really, really good. I had a great boss as a clerk in North Sydney and uh, got some tennis coaching, did a bit of judo and it was fun. And then for some reason, I, after 15 months, I decided to go back. It was God, even though I wasn't born again. And I came back to the farm, um, yeah, March, April, 71. Worked on the farm again, it was a bit better, but still, deep down in my heart, it was uh, very empty. And in 73, my dad got cancer. And I, I found myself praying that he wouldn't survive. But I wasn't a Christian. That was just instinctive sort of, God, you know, and before that too, I prayed, oh, God, if you're alive, let the house burn down. So it's a totally twisted sort of mind. And the house did burn down. And God must have just seen it was going to happen and allowed me to start with that. So God was searching for me to. Can I help you? God was just, he was after me. He's trying to reveal himself to me. I remember one occasion working on the farm and I, I was on a tractor and at midnight I stopped to have my lunch. And I was on the night shift, obviously. And I looked up the stars and uh, I felt this peace as I looked at the stars. I thought there must be a creator. And that's when this peace continued to linger there. And then I forgot about it. Another occasion, my dad and I were trying to round up some, we had these cattle in a two, small 200 acre paddock called a ram paddock. And we're trying to separate the heifers from the steers. We got them in the corner of a paddock, had the gate open, we we're trying to filter off the steers. And I keep breaking and tearing off it. My dad would tear off the vehicle and try to bring them back again. And he finally in frustration took off. And I found myself praying. I said, God, if you're there, would you help me? And I stood back, whatever, 30, 40 feet, or meters or whatever back, had the gate open and I saw a couple of steers. It was like what, in the corner like that. And I'd run and the heifers were about to go and I stepped forward a bit. Perfectly separated these eight cattle, <laughs> which is an impossibility, of course. So God was saying, I am here when you're caught out here, but still, I was a bit dull of understanding. And um, so it wasn't until um, 1974, as I said, 16th of June. My mum had got born again a couple of years before, and she was praying for her kids to meet Jesus, to get born again. 
And um, she invited me to a, a Christian gathering in Dubbo, Central West New South Wales, called the Logos Foundation. They were sponsoring me, this um, interdenominational gathering. And uh, obviously, my mum would be very sneaky. She'd been really praying. My older sister got, got born again. And she, her eyes were miraculously healed in the tractor one day. She was thinking, if Jesus lives in me, I should have perfect eyesight. And bang, she was instantly healed. So little things that were obviously seeds that were dropping in my heart. I also found myself listening to a Derek Prince tape on miracles. And this was before I was born again, but I heard, my mum had it going, I heard myself you know, listening, taking some truths in to my spirit. But anyway, I listened to them talk about the church and whatever, because I didn't really remember anything they said. And it was time, just about time to go home. It was a Saturday. I started to sing a song, and many of you heard me share this song. It was Move Holy Spirit, Move in my life. Move Holy Spirit, make me like Christ. But the song was just melodic, and um, those words, move, move, move in my life, make me like Christ. And they kept playing it, they kept singing over and over again, and people had their hands raised. And I thought, that looks nice. I haven't seen that before, so I'll try that. Move, Holy Spirit, move in my life. Make me like Christ. And suddenly the words became a prayer, became a desire. And it became, Holy Spirit, would you move in my life? Make me. And I felt this electrical rain just pouring into me. My eyes closed, I could sense Jesus, I knew Jesus. And I was born again, I was born from above. I was born from heaven. <laughs> I want to feel him. Jesus. And uh, it's funny, I went went home and uh, my mum had been giving me a good news Bible to read and I'd been reading just trying to be obedient to her, nothing happened but now of course the word of God is alive and she said we've got a Bible study at the headmaster's place in, in Galah would you like to come along this whatever night it was, Thursday night I said what's it about, she said the blood of Jesus I said the blood of Jesus Ugh, that sounds like gr grotesque if we think about the blood of Jesus but to me First time I heard it, I don't talk about his blood for. Anyway, she obviously was sneaky again and prayed, said, would you please bring Anthony along, Holy Spirit? Went along and really enjoyed it. And they're talking about the issue with Aborigines, the problem in the township. And they're talking about different solutions. And I said, well, why don't we just pray? That's all we've got to do. I've been born again two or three days now. Why don't we just pray? And God will do it. You know, so. God dropped something in the spirit. Anyway, backtracking a few days, I was saved. And um, on the Saturday and the Monday, I was going around the property, checking the sheep, checking the dams, cutting burrs, thistles, checking broken wires and fences, that sort of thing. I saw a dead calf in one of the back paddocks. And I thought, oh, gee, we just better pray for that and raise it up. <laughs> I've been born again for 48 hours now. But so, I think it was something from the Derek Prince. Uh, said that I listened to but she, I prayed and prayed and nothing happened. I said, oh, that's funny. Anyway, I remember them, the ministers talking about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just like, Ali Magali, Ali Magali. And uh, being very simple and childlike, I suppose, I said, oh, well, I better try that then. So I got on my knees and Ali Magali for about half an hour. This is ridiculous. I'm going to get up now. But I felt, one more time. One more time. And as I was doing that by faith, the sensation was as if I could hear the sound coming down. It was mostly just a sensation. And I felt this cloak settle over me. And I heard myself speaking with these, this language I never learned. And the joy kicked in again. And I'd drive in the mini moat further on around the paddocks and I'd listen to myself and then I'd burst out laughing again. So that's the way I got born again. That's who I was. That's how I got born again. Had a passion for the Word of God. I couldn't help but praise God all day for the next few years and just kept soaking up tapes, cassette tapes as well. Bought myself an organ, learned to play move, Holy Spirit, move in my life, make me like Christ. And um, things went going tremendously. Even when I went swimming in a local swimming pool, I'd open my eyes to and still be looking to see Jesus, to see the glory of God. I just have to have this love 
which I'd never experienced before. I didn't want to let go of the supernatural life and presence of God. Anyway, 77, uh, April 16th, I'd met uh, Tom Jewett's daughter, who was a famous Anglican charismatic minister, and uh, we got married. Didn't love her. I don't think I was capable really of really knowing love at the time, but I was very comfortable in her presence. And um, we got married in 77, and about um, eight months, whatever, it was January next year, 1978, that God told us to go down to a short-term Bible college course in Randwick called Vision Bible College, which was just a four and a half month course. And um, I love to pray, and there's another guy, Peter Floyd, who became an apostle, who we were allowed to pray later at night in this chapel. But it's interesting, I was about to leave, and I said, God, is there anything you want to say to me? And I heard him say, unless you open your heart more to other people, I can't do anything more in your life. So I just sing all the time, sing on, didn't communicate because of my, my past. I hadn't really developed those communication skills. So I would have loved God, but there would have been a shallowness there. He couldn't have kept taking up. Unless you open your heart more to others, I can't do anything more in your life. So I said, okay, okay. And God suddenly started to, to do a work there. Once he was asking my permission. That's the amazing thing. The power, the wonder of free will. Anyway, it was a great course, we thoroughly enjoyed it, and then we got an invite from Tom Jewett, who was the director of Teen Challenge in, at King's Cross. He and Anne, and of course, who's now my father-in-law, I called him Dad, and Anne I called Mum. And they said, we put down one condition that all the board members would be 100% in agreement. We would know this was God's will. I had a witness, and uh, we prayed about it, Victoria, my wife and I prayed about it, and said, yep, as soon as the the course finishes, and uh, just as it finished, Victoria gave birth to my eldest, David. But um, Teen Challenge is renowned for drug rehabilitation. It's the most successful drug, or was the most successful drug rehabilitation program in the world, especially the centre over in the United States. There was a government survey um, that showed that Teen Challenge had an 86% success rate after five years. Their program, methadone program had about 11 or 13 percent success rate. And there's a, a, um, a movie made called The Jesus Factor. So in Team Challenge, um, after a couple of weeks of just helping out, Tom said, are you right to start casting our demons down? Because his gifting was counselling, inner healing and deliverance. I just looked at him and said, you know, I don't know, am I? And uh, see, we've got a young man from the Centers of God Church. He's got demonic issues, problems. The pastors, he's brought him in. So there was another more mature guy there, and we spent six hours, which you're not meant to do. We normally should have two-hour appointments. And uh, we started manifesting. He said, he said, okay, and we started praying about things. He started involuntarily just going into all these karate footworks and actions. And I realized, whoa, there is something there. And so we're able by the Spirit of God to cast together, cast those spirits out. And it wasn't long before I was being given three appointments every day, two hour appointments. We'd come together, team challenge, we'd have our devotions corporately, start, I'd have an appointment from 10 to 12, lunch 12 to 1, then 1 to 3 and 3 to 5. And that was the most glorious, glorious time. And the beautiful thing is we didn't have a set format for how you are to go about helping people. Tom believed the Holy Spirit said Anthony is ready and therefore he was going to do the rest. And so I just think, I remember one, one guy, I'll, I'll never forget his, his name is Alfred because he became an FGB uh, member in Sydney. But um, his wife had been receiving ministry successfully and he made an appointment and was given, was given to me. So he walked in, as soon as he walked in, to the counselling room, I felt a piece of silence. Don't say anything. And so we both sat down for three minutes, whatever, four minutes, I don't know, saying nothing. 
And later on, he told me, I caught up with him about 20 years later, he said, Anthony, I remember, if you'd start speaking to me or quoting the scriptures, I was so tense, I would have got up and walked out the door. But God just gave this, don't say anything. And I said, what's, what's happening, Alfred? He said, just while I was sitting here, I remember it as a little boy in Lebanon. And I used to run next door and, and pinch the grapes. From, and this old guy used to run out to try to catch me, the guy who owned it property of the farmer and uh, he said ever since then I've had this tremendous fear and at night I even see him coming to get me and uh, he's a successful business he said I'm a successful business and I've got a lovely wife I've got a swimming pool I've got everything but I have this fear and uh, straight away I knew what to do and I said Lord Jesus would you stand between Alfred and this spirit this image of this man would you stand between them Big burly guy jumped up straight away. Not tall, but very thick set. And I saw tears running down his cheeks. He said, it's just lifted off. He had a spirit of fear that entered him. And the Holy Spirit knew how to set him free. And I've never, ever forgotten that. Um, I saw one lady bounced around the floor on her bottom. Stuff that you just know this is. <laughs> If I hadn't been there, there was one man by the name of, I won't say, just say his first name, Bill, and that is his actual name. He travelled the world to seek freedom from demonic uh, oppression. He, when he was a boy in England, he went to a house where there had been a murder and he felt this cold form coming to him. And then he was very agitated and fearful. He went to the Anglican Church and they suggested he go to the spiritualist society for help. We ended up having more demons. He went to Africa with the witch doctors and they became fearful of him. He could heal people through demonic spirits, which I believe Satan counterfeits, but he does take over the person's soul in the process. Anyway, Tom had done bulk of the work. He spent about 18 months praying for him. He said, I think I'd like to hand Bill over to you now. And that was fun. That was really fun. He said, put your, put your lightning rod on my, my back again, Anthony. You could feel the electricity and the power of God going into him. But one day, I was sitting there, and he stood up and started to shake. And he said, Anthony, I think I'm going to throw you out the window. We're two stories up. But again, that supernatural peace. And as he walked over close to me, he fell to the floor. Put my hand upon him, and he said, broke out. We both laughed in the spirit. But I was only five years in the Lord, four or five years in the Lord. Um, but there are times and seasons, and with God, if we're in God, if we're hungry, if we're seeking Him, He can do anything. And that's, that's the truth there. Um, we also travelled. We went down to Eden, I know. Uh, we um, went to Rockdale in Sydney. And there we had the opportunity to minister some Catholic teenagers. And there were 14 there that responded, wanting to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And uh, Victoria and I and another young lady were there. And we sh sh shared one of the movies and shared our testimonies. And um, we started praying for one couple. And uh, Victoria said, this is going to take a long time. And uh, why don't you just pray? And says, so okay, we'll pray, Holy Spirit, would you fall on the people here? Would you baptise them, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit? And we went back to praying for this couple. And after about a minute, we thought, what is that, what is that buzzing sound? What, how come the whole place is just buzzing? We looked around, every single one were boyfriend and girlfriend, head on head, just weeping, praying in, in their new language, baptising the Holy Spirit in a moment. A glorious moments like that. Went to Gorgandra with the team. And I was the one who was asked to give the altar call. And eight young uh, teenagers, or eight teenagers, 15, 16, came out, gave out. I could feel the anointing of God coming out from me. I could literally physically feel it. And I heard about 15 years later that that group was still meeting together and having Bible studies. So we had an absolutely amazing 13 months. Um, anyway, and Tom Jewett felt he and Anne were meant to lead the mission in London, London Healing Mission, 
no invitation, just had a prompting from the Holy Spirit, packed up, went over there, and, and said, got the witness, and the other said, yes, you're the ones to, to lead our mission. And uh, we were expecting to go and join them in England, but I fasted for a week or 10 days, and just felt God said, go back, prayer groups need you back at Galatia, and go back home. But just going back a little bit, in the, Bi in the, um, the Bible College, the uh, Dorothy Langstaff, she was the um, principal's wife. She was a prophet and she had a vision for me, a, prophet, a prophetic word for me. And it wasn't very nice. She said, oh, Anthony, I don't feel like giving this, but I see gross darkness. And I see waves and they're crashing on you. <laughs> but then I see them clear and then I see you walking on the, on the water. And the love of God is going to really feel you and start to flow out. And I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I said, sorry. <laughs> Went back home and uh, to the farm, where my brother was running the property now. And uh, he had fallen away from the Lord in 98. And um, where are we now? Beg your pardon. 1978, he fell away from the Lord, beg your pardon. Went back to the farm in 79. And spent seven years there, and um, my brother started to have a go at me, and the guys worked for us. But Satan had it all planned. At night, he visit me with terrible nightmares, stress. I thought it was a great challenge the first couple of months, and weeks turned into months, turned into years. And uh, all the time, I was just singing and worshiping God all day, just to try to relax my shoulders, just to try to see Him again. But after about four years of this, three and a half years, whatever, I got a phone call from, call from a lady in Canamble, just half an hour, 40 minutes drive from further north. We've been praying for a leader, and uh, God keeps putting your name, keeps giving, keeps giving us your name. Would you come and lead this prayer group, this Bible study? Well, at this stage, I couldn't read the Word of God. For the work period, I just couldn't take anything in. But God said to me one day, I was concerned about that, He said, when the Word of Knowledge fails, the word of the Spirit will prevail. And he gave me understanding. He goes, I'm giving you these songs, Anthony, to sing, and every so often I'll drop a rain into your heart. And he was feeding me that way. Anyway, I went up there, and there was only about seven, I think six, seven, eight people there. And they looked around, and they had a few prayers. And Could you bring the word of the Lord to us now, Anthony? Word of the Lord. Okay. Straight away, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Ooh. So I simply sh shared it as I knew it to be. You know, one guy got right out of, into debt. The master came along, he got thrown into prison, he unless you pay up. Please have mercy upon me. As you know, the master said, okay, I forgive you the whole debt. Then he sees another guy that owes him a thousand bucks, five hundred bucks, pay up! Rascal, you owe me that money. Please have mercy upon me. I have thrown him into prison. So the servants, as you know, complained to the Lord. Yeah. The Lord said, bring that man to me. I've forgiven you all that debt. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? Throw him into prison. It talks about, and then Jesus, and then I was sharing this, and Jesus looked at the apostles and he said, yeah, So shall my heavenly Father do to every one of you, Amen. unless you forgive you from your heart, your brother. So it was talking about how God will hands over the torturers. God will allow the demonic if we carry unforgiveness and unmerciful. I shared that. And my lady invited me and said, What are you talking about that for? Because she was a very strong, straight from the shoulder type woman. I said, I don't know. And she got up and walked across to another lady and didn't know what was happening. But as she was talking, everyone started putting their hands up. You could feel this rain, literally. God, the Holy Spirit, just raining upon us. She was apologising and getting her heart right. And I believe that group had been seeking God for a long time and God was just longing to pour his spirit out, but wasn't prepared to because there was this sin in the camp. 15 months every Thursday this went on for, and we had up to 28 people in that house. The power of God was there every time. We had revival. 
There was one woman who came along, her two sisters invited her and she said, Anthony, as you're talking about Jesus, I've been a Catholic all my life, but I realised I hadn't invited Jesus in and I did that as you were talking, but would you pray for me? Pray for her. She fell to the ground and she's, I got down on my knees and she said, I feel things snapping and leaving me. They're snapping off and leaving me now. And she had wonderful deliverance. And it's only about, I think, four, five, six months later, she died. And I thought, oh my goodness. But the sisters, her sister said, she was wonderful. She'd been very sick for a long time. She said, she's talking about her wonderful Jesus in the hospital, witnessing to everybody. Her face had glow. She got gloriously saved. This was going when I was going through my massive trial. And uh, so I've learned a secret that if you've got Jesus, you've got everything. Yes. Anyway, they went for seven years, the trial, but after 15 months, this lady got jealous about a new couple that came. And I put my hand on her, I could feel power, sitting like a bank there. And one time she did, I said, you need to get your heart right, and she said no, but she phoned me in the, in the weeks that I'd been gone around town and my heart's right. And things continued up to 15 months. And then that same issue came, this an envy issue. She wasn't prepared to let it go. And God said, I don't want you to go back again. But I was disobedient. I felt responsible. I went back next week. It was just like a little prayer meeting, my nice little prayers, but no power. I mean, I saw people, a lady with a bad back, and uh, I felt, well, I knew the Lord was saying, don't pray for a healing. Ask this question, are you carrying burdens at the moment? Are you worrying about many things? She said, yes, I'm very anxious about things. I said, you need to repent of that. Amen. As soon as she, she repented, I could feel heat going into her back. And God instantly healed her back. Wonderful things were happening. Anyway, after, um, so after that I didn't go back again. And I was obedient. Then a church tried to establish a church there, an IAG church, from what happened there. But um, seven years there, and then I started to feel joy. I started to, come, I started to feel a peace. I started to feel myself relaxing and calming down. I was also like a, a, a partial assistant for about three and a half years in the Anglican Church. I used to preach for a period of time, about half the time. Also, and I set the Lord during the night for two or three hours. And I remember one time um, a lady was coming, and her husband would never come in. And I was in the toilet, and I saw him pull up to go in the toilet. And I said, Lord, would you put in this guy's heart? Let him think it's his thoughts. Well, I'm here with my wife, I may as well come in today. And that's exactly what happened. God answered that, dropped those thoughts in his head, and he joined her to the church service. That's after seven years, we, uh, it was uh, when God put on our hearts to, to come to Canberra. I thought it was meant to go into the end of the ministry, and uh, that didn't work out. My theological framework was too narrow. And uh, what do you mean by drawing near to God? I said, you know, you know, you, you praise and you worship Him and by faith, and then He just comes and fills you, and these serious faces. So that was foreign to me because I thought every Christian loves Jesus and knows the Holy Spirit because they're Christians. Anyway, didn't work out, but still God said, go to Canberra. So four young kids, we packed up December 86, help me Jesus, and uh, moved down. And I said, maybe I can pump gas or do something just so I can spend time with Jesus. Anyway, I went across, we got a house in um, Downer, Black Street Downer. I went across to Dixon to an ATM and uh, there was a real estate shop front there and to my shock and my horror I heard, go and ask for work. Like my own thoughts, go and ask for work. I thought, I don't know anything here. Anyway, I went back, Victoria said, got nothing to lose. So next morning, went across there, it was Monday morning, next morning. And walked in, a guy came up to me, can I help you sir? I'm looking for work, I'm down from the country. So he said, let me just ring the boss. And she's in another office. 
And I thought, okay, I looked around, saw some files, maybe I can do some filing. I did that way back when I was a young man. And but I heard this salesman saying, there's a guy who's just come in the office, he's from the country, he wants to get into real estate sales. <laughs> and I literally heard this, I was like, Lord, you know. She said, okay. Is he married? Yes, can he his wife come to my office in Bill Connor tomorrow? Went there, no wage, commission only, but we had great peace. We had great peace. And uh, so, started the next day. And uh, I haven't got time to. God bless me. In the first six months, I was just getting one side a month, and it was just, Lord, have your angels bring the people. This is my real estate expertise. Direct them, Lord, at the, at the uh, roundabout where I've got the signs. It didn't work when I asked for one boss. Lord, that's the problem. I need two boss. Thank you, Jesus. But all it was was faith. Yeah. And that was amazing. The time I prayed that prayer with faith, one guy came in. I said, that's, that's the first buyer. It was a property in Page, Lumen Street Page. And, um, and uh, he said, I'd like to put an offer in. And I was sitting on the lounge taking an offer. Another guy walked in. I said, that's the second buyer. And he put an offer in too. But when he heard that it was the first offer, he pulled out. But that was my very first sale. And after six months like that, I think it was August um, 1987, I had six sales in September. And uh, I got eight sales in the first 15 days of October. And um, three in November, but back to four or five in December. And things just really took off. But I want to bring something out, which I had, half as I hadn't planned to say. Um, one time with Judy, who was the, the boss, she brought me in and I'd been considered and called her golden head boy. And she just started getting stuck into me about something. I can't even remember what it was about. But I found myself standing there just looking at her and said, Judy, are you okay? And she broke down and went, and my dad's very, very sick. I've been very upset lately. But yeah, I wish I could live all my life and all my uh, times with issues like that. But it was the spirit of God. The Bible talks about he can be a shield for our heart. Anyway, so God blessed us there. Um, we were there for seven years. And again, um, we were able to buy our first house in down, the house where we were renting. We had $75 left over after a 95% loan. And the 7,000 grand, I think, it was. <laughs> so that was good. That was um, in April 1988. But um, we, um, things were happening with, with, with Victoria that she had been unhappy and I, I hadn't picked it up. And she wanted me to move office, so I moved to O'Connor. Uh, the Century 21 was being established from. And um, things weren't the same there. And uh, Christmas Day, 95. We sold the house, she wanted to sell the house. We moved into a big five bedroom on suite, rented property in Flynn. And she said, I'm, I'm leaving. And it's interesting, I won't say that thing, it's all right. Yeah, it's interesting because my natural response was to go into the lounge room and to worship God. Because God, what God has shown me and taught me on the farm were two foundational truths. Two foundational scriptures that even today are life transforming for anybody. And that's all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Um, that's Romans 28. And uh, just that first part was the first part he gave me. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I live that out. And I practiced it. I remember when I had the tractor, this little grey food tractor, bolt to the axle. And I was like, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, it's going to work out for my good. And as I continued to praise him and thank him and shovel and, and jack it up and try to get bark and wood underneath to get it out for a couple of hours, 
I was so drenched, not only with water from the rain, but so drenched in the presence of God. Because I couldn't wait to see what good thing was going to come out of this. Because God had said that all things work together for my good. And he said that in everything give thanks. Amen. And I'm just revisiting that now. I'm very far around the tennis court. I'm very passionate. And I keep saying, God, I'm going to work out for my good. And of course he gave me the other part of the scripture. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of Christ. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That Jesus saying that he might be the first of many like him. And I learned that we can get bitter or better. We are being transformed, but not necessarily into Christ. It's depending on what's coming out of our mouth. And I remember a man who um, got into problems uh, uh, and uh, was taken to court. He was having an affair with his daughter. And um, he was out of the house, so we took, he said he could live with us for six months. And obviously he'd repented and everything like that. But I heard him complaining to me. I said, you need to praise God. And as I said that, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I'm taking the wine out of my people, the W-H-I-N-E, to give them my wine. And we need to be careful, us oldies who have been around a long time, because God has established a certain living righteousness, because we're, he does what is right is righteous, because he has sanctified us to a certain degree, that we can stop pressing forward, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to that which is ahead, I press toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And um, I'm just getting back again, reminding myself, no matter what happens, if I start giving thanks in all circumstances, I'm going to get better and better, because I'll be conformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will come, because I'm a doer of the Word, I'll be blessed in my doing. Don't be a hearer and not a doer, deceiving myself. Simple truths. We say, yeah, I know that. But the Holy Spirit is bringing me back. Do that, Anthony. I'm longing to fill you with myself and my intention. Move, Holy Spirit, move in my life. Move, Holy Spirit, make me like Christ. Amen. That's what I was born again in. God gave me a dream of becoming beautiful from somebody who had no beauty. And Jesus said to me one time in a tractor on the farm, he's, I knew he'd say, whatever you ask for me, Anthony, I'll give it to you. And I said, I'd like to my eyes healed, I'd like this happened, I'd like something else. And uh, he said, would you like this? Would you like to become like my son, Jesus? Yeah. I don't even think, I, I didn't say yes straight away, so I repented that 643 times, <laughs> approximately. Yeah. Thankfully, I can hear him say, I'm building a people of power. I'm making a people of praise. Who will go through this land by my spirit and shall glorify my precious name. So life has moved on. As I said, I went through divorce. I officially went through 2nd of May 1998. Um, God had a word for me that I see restoration. It's interesting, you know, we think, well, you must have been a terrible sinner to get divorced. But a prophet had a word, he said, because you've been a, a threat to Satan, he has attacked you in your family situation. Didn't know me from a bar of soap. But I see restoration. So I thought he's going to bring Victoria back. I fasted for 20 days. I sought God until he said, I've given her time to repent, but she would not. And uh, guess what? How many years later? 11 years later, Heather and I got together. God brought Heather across my path. The interesting thing is we met in 1999. 
the day before my birthday, and we actually weren't sitting opposite each other. There was, this, there was a singles dinner at Bellucci's in Dixon, which I don't think it's any longer. There was long tables right there like this, and uh, I was I was there, and Heather was just down one, and uh, suddenly a lady came in late and wanted to sit next to a friend right at the top. So everyone said, move down everyone, <laughs> move down. So I was sitting opposite Heather, and we talked away, and she, I said, I'm in real estate, and she said, aren't real estate agents pushy? <laughs> so I spoke, I said, oh, I'd like to sell a home as if it's my own home. And that was Yeah, yeah. But she, I'll have to embarrass her now, she prayed for me, or oh, actually, uh, I'm going to tell on Heather, when she went home, she got out a pad and wrote down, Heather Connell, Heather Connell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she prayed for a year for me, nothing happened. And seven years passed, and uh, she ended up going to church just here, which is now Units. It was the CAC church, Jamison. And a friend was dying of cancer and wanted to come across here. Heather lived on the south side, so she didn't want to come across at all. But to look after a friend, she brought her across. And we re met in June 2006. And um, well, we've been married um, 12 and a half years now. Okay. With God's hands upon us. Bless her. Yeah. She's, God's used Heather Grady to help open me up more and more. She's so passionate, so caring, and uh, a great blessing in my life. Yeah. But one thing too, uh, I don't know how this doesn't fit in at all, but I came with some money and I was going, I booked into a, a full gospel business world convention across in, in America, in Los Angeles, uh, near Los Angeles, and um, I wanted my mate, Mike, to come along, so I felt God say pay for his trip, and uh, his wife wanted to come, and they were able to get enough money for her to come too, but years and years, years later, I didn't know, years and years later, Anthony, I've really got a passion, I want to become generous like you, one act of generosity, we don't know what people are taking in from our example. And another example too, and this is the grace of God, it's only the grace of God. Because if we don't have the presence of God, we're just going to revert back. We don't have the word of God in us. A guy said to me uh, only a couple of years ago now, he said, Anthony, when you used to go to AOG Church, and the way you talked about Victoria after you split up, I'll never forget, you never put it down. And we don't know what words are happening, or what, what, what words are, what are being deposited in people's hearts. You know, let your light shine before people. They may see your good works and glorify your Father. Both these gentlemen glorified the Father and want to be like Him. Praise God. He's not dead, I can hear Him say. He's very much alive. Amen. So God has been very good. Praise him. Praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I just got a little few thoughts here where it says God is looking for us to pursue him with a fresh new determination. He keeps bringing back a scripture to me from Isaiah 64, verse 7a. And this is the Amplified Version. It says, And no one calls on your name and awakens and bestirs himself to take and keep hold of you. God says, will you take hold of me? Will you press in, not just enjoy your, your time of fellowship with me, which is beautiful. It keeps us sound, it keeps us at peace. But God says, I'd like you to take hold of me by faith. Stay until you sense my glorious presence rising up within you. Because then I'll give you fresh passion, fresh vision. I'll, I'll empower you. I'll strengthen with you. Because you're waiting upon me, you'll renew your strength like the eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. And we think, well, God, I'll pass it now. I've come to realise that the older I get and the older you get, the more pleasure we experience. 
The Bible says that we're changed from one degree of glory to another as we behold him. That's the key. Saying, Lord, I'd like to look at your face again. I'd like to drink from you, Jesus, because you said, if any man thirst. Jesus cried out when he said that. He was so passionate. He said, I want people to come to me that they may be just like me, flowing with peace and love and joy, supernatural. And God is no respecter of persons. And Satan says, that's the I want to shut that person down. I don't want them to become like that. So this is just a, a little plea from me. It's a plea from God to me, very much so as well. Yes, I nearly that done. So it's been a long night, everyone's saying. Praise God. Just in case there's something else here. Yeah. All right. Just that uh, what Dima Shikarin said, that the full gospel business fellowship is, when he talked about businessmen, he said ordinary people becoming extraordinary by the power of God. Whether we are as weak as a Gideon or as lacking in confidence as a Moses, God says it doesn't matter. Because if I, if I fill that vessel, it will be extraordinary. Amen. And Jesus has paid the price. He shed his blood that we can come to the throne of grace. And the glory of God, the glory of God, the glory of God will become our experience again and again. And I'll tell you what, the wisdom that most people have got here, could you imagine with that filled and flooded with a fresh anointing? The young people, other people out there just needing to hear a quickened word that will create a fire in their belly. Not only beautiful wisdom, but the anointing of God's wisdom. We need to hand the mantle on Thank you, Father. I've said enough. <coughs> Praise God. He is so beautiful. So my, my charge to you is let's not rest on what we have accomplished. Remember what Demas Shakarin said? He said, Demas Shakarin is not satisfied with the past, what we've accomplished. Tens of millions saved, maybe hundreds of millions saved. He said, God told him we're just getting started, Demas. My challenge is please come before God in prayer time and just say, God, I would love to have a fresh encounter with you. And the flesh will be saying, No, no, you don't. I just exhort you in that regard. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Praise God. Thank you, Anthony. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Absolutely encouraging. Yeah. Nothing is powerful as when someone gives their witness. I'd like to invite um, Anthony back up again. And um, Frank, Lee, would you come up? And I'm just, as we always do, I just want to invite people to come up for prayer. Um,